Section 1. Curriculum Vitae. You will hear a man and a woman talking about a curriculum vitae, or CV. Read the example. What's up, Jun He? You don't look happy. I rang about three jobs today, Harry. Two of them had already gone. The last employer asked for my CV, which I sent off straight away, but I know he won't call back. The answer is back. On this occasion only, the first part of the conversation is played twice. Before you listen again, you have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 4. What's up, Jun He? You don't look happy. I rang about three jobs today, Harry. Two of them had already gone. The last employer asked for my CV, which I sent off straight away, but I know he won't call back. Oh dear. Would you like a cup of tea? Thanks a lot. What I'd really like is some advice. I haven't had a single job interview in the entire month I've been looking for work, and if I don't find something soon, I'll have to borrow money from my parents again to continue my studies. I really don't want to do that. I saw your friend Fumiko today. Why don't you get a job with her in the cafe? I'd love to, but I've never worked in hospitality in any capacity. In fact, that's one of my problems. I don't have much experience at anything. I've only been a nanny for a summer in Paris just before I started my undergraduate degree. Didn't you work for your uncle in Seoul? I worked for a fortnight when his office assistant was away, but I wouldn't call that a job. What did you do? Photocopying and typing, mostly. I'm not very good at typing. Is that job on your CV? No, I was too ashamed to include it. Besides, what would happen if anyone actually gave me a typing test? I'd fail miserably. I've got an idea. Show me your CV and I'll help you redesign it. Would you, Harry? I'd really appreciate that. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 5 to 10. Looking at your CV, I do like the colours you've chosen. I'd certainly keep them. Do you know what I mean by the word font? The style of the letters, whether they are Times New Roman or Arial? Yes. You've got about ten different fonts. I thought that'd show I had creative flair. It's fun to use a variety, isn't it? Fun for a party invitation. Stick to two fonts is my advice. All right. What about the content? You're a local lad. I expect you can give me some pointers about the content. Your education in Korea is fine. And so is being a nanny. In Britain, people don't usually mention whether they're single or married. It's unnecessary to include your hobbies, especially if they're dangerous. Are you sure about that? Doesn't snowboarding make me sound more interesting? Like a person who's looking for a challenge? No. Employers might think you won't find their job exciting enough. 
It seems we should cross off both my marital status and my sports. I can't see here that you're a master's student, or that you've got a driving license. No, I didn't want to say I was doing a postgrad course because an employer might wonder why I'm applying for such a lowly job. I didn't mention being able to drive because almost everyone here my age can. Do I really need to spell that out? Yes, and you're fluent in Mandarin, right? Right. I studied in Nanjing for almost two years as part of an exchange program. My spoken Mandarin is pretty good, and if necessary, I could brush up my writing. I used to know about two thousand characters. I picked up some French while I was nanning in Paris, but I'm hardly fluent, and I doubt it would be useful to an employer here. So, let's add driver's license and three languages as your skills. We'll forget about your being single and the snowboarding. Let's keep the blue, put all the text on the left, and reduce the fonts. Thanks, Harry. That's much better. Section two, copper sculpture. You will hear an artist talking about her copper sculpture. Before you listen, you have thirty seconds to read questions eleven to fourteen. And now on Art Today, I've got Michelle Blanche. Good morning. So you're off to Italy tomorrow? Yes, I'm taking part in a major international art exhibition called the Venice Biennale. Congratulations! What work are you taking? Ten small copper sculptures that I'm just putting the finishing touches to. They're on the theme of people and pets. That's kind of a strange theme for a contemporary art show, isn't it? Perhaps, but I follow traditions that date back to ancient Greece. I believe in highly developed craft as well as accessibility to the viewer. Frankly, I find a lot of modern art has alienated the public both with its form and content. I'm trying to create something that people can easily respond to. So why people and pets? You're not the first person to have asked me that question. Actually, I've never owned a pet myself, but last year I saw an amazing TV program about a general hospital in Calgary. Volunteers take dogs onto wards there during visiting hours, and the presence of the animals has been found to improve patients' health significantly. Raising the spirit does wonders for the body. It seems that people heal faster if they can be around an animal or if they have their own pet. So I decided to explore this in my artwork. Interesting. Who buys your sculptures? I've sold to both private art collectors and public museums. All up, about twenty of my small works have been purchased by individuals. The Lightfoot Building downtown has one of my early copper pieces in its foyer. You can see it through the window from Brook Street, and two regional museums have bought large bronze sculptures that I made in 2011. And you've just been asked by the mayor to produce a statue, right? Not the mayor himself, but a local council. The council had a competition for a work based on local history, which I won. I'm making a sculpture for a square downtown. It's my first major outdoor commission, so I'm very excited. Anything to do with animals? Yes, it honours a dog that saved a girl in the river. Everyone in the city knows this story. It's practically a legend, but there's not one memorial to this incredible act of devotion. Before you listen to the rest of the interview, you have thirty seconds to read questions fifteen to twenty.
So, Michelle, tell our listeners about the process of making a large copper sculpture. For me, the process is as remarkable and as enjoyable as the finished product. It's physically quite tough, which I think accounts for not many women pursuing metal-based sculpture. Generally, I submit a portfolio of work to a client. After being chosen for a commission, I spend around two weeks modelling the sculpture in clay. Then I make a perfect wax copy, coated in a slurry of stucco and ducted with ceramic granules. Hang on a minute. That's too technical for me. OK. Basically, I make a clay model, then I make a copy in wax. I use wax because, ultimately, this will be melted and replaced with copper. The wax model is painted with a special liquid, which is called stucco. It's a kind of soft plaster. Then the stucco is sprayed with tiny grains of ceramic to make a hard shell or cast. What's next? The cast is fired, heated to a very high temperature, in an industrial furnace. My studio is in a disused boiler-making factory and I'm very fortunate to have this furnace. The firing process is a little dangerous, so I employ two assistants. While they're firing the cast, I prepare the metal. The copper? Yes. In fact, a copper sculpture is not 100% copper. It consists of three elements, 95% copper, 4% silicon and 1% manganese. The trace elements strengthen the copper without altering its other qualities. Uh huh. After the cast is made, the molten metal is poured in and left to set. Setting takes several hours, depending on the size of the work. When the cast is removed, the sculpture is polished. This also takes time, but is quite thrilling since you see the brightly shining metal emerge beneath your hands. As I said before, the process is quite physically demanding, but the end result is gorgeous. Indeed. Finally, it's approved by the commissioning authority and installed in its permanent place. In this case, the city square. When is the installation date? The 3rd of June, which marks the centenary of the girls' rescue. Section 3. University counselling session. You will hear a student talking about her problems with the counsellor. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 26. So, Rachel, how have things been going? All right, I suppose. Are you ready for your presentation tomorrow? I think so. Great. What about the rest of the study plan we made? Have you been sticking to it? Well, that's why I came back to you. I did manage to get everything done for my presentation, but now I'm way behind with my other assignments and I'm starting to panic. You've got the 3,000-word essay for criminal law, haven't you? And one on taxation? That's right. What seems to be preventing you from doing them? My own indecision is one factor. You see, we were given two choices for the criminal law essay and I seem to change my mind daily about which one to do. I remember in our last session that you said I might be using procrastination to obscure some other inadequacy, perhaps not understanding the legal topic as well as I ought to. If I get a low mark, I can just say, well, I did that essay in such a rush, instead of admitting that I don't have a grasp of the subject. 
Intellectually, I understand what you've told me, but I'm afraid it hasn't made a difference to my starting the essay. Another thing that's affecting me is the demands of other people. Like what? Take my flatmate, Teresa, who's a nursing student. We've been sharing a flat for over a year and we used to get along really well. But recently, she's been pestering me to help her with her assignments. You might suggest your flatmate get help from her college with her studies. I've done that and she claims she's been going to the Student Learning Centre on campus. Meantime, if I don't help her at home, she calls me selfish or arrogant or unfriendly and then starts sulking. The atmosphere in our place is poisonous. What can I do about my boss? Last week I worked 12 hours overtime. I'm exhausted. I felt obliged to accept the work because right now he's making decisions about who to keep on over the summer and if I turn down extra shifts, he may not consider me. I certainly can't afford to lose my summer job. Remember, Rachel, your goals and priorities. Is your long-term goal to work in a supermarket or to be a lawyer? Of course, to be a lawyer. I know I've got to concentrate on that. As I think I've said, I can see everything clearly when I'm here in the office with you, but I waver as soon as I leave. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 27 to 30. You wanted to talk about your ex-boyfriend, Dan. Yes, Dan. Hmm. I know we went through all this in the last session as well, but he's been bugging me again. What does he want? To get back together. Do you want that? Yes. No. I mean, I ended the relationship... Dan's a great person and I'll always think of him fondly, but we somehow brought out the worst in each other. All right. Keep Dan at a distance while you focus on your studies. Politely tell him that you want to remain apart. Let's make another study plan now with your starting work on your 3,000-word essay tomorrow. That's due on the 9th, isn't it? Yes, just ten days away. I can't possibly do it by then. Even if I settle on a topic, the reading list is as long as my arm. And I've another confession to make. I've barely attended a single tutorial for that course, so I don't even understand the basics. With the state I'm in, I won't be able to absorb any of the complex arguments let alone critique them. Really, my situation's awful. Do you think I could get an extension? Rachel, your situation is difficult, not awful. And all of these things we can solve. Remember, reduce contact with people who don't help you and reduce your hours at the supermarket. Focus on your essays and your future goal. Section 4. Rational Emotive Therapy You will hear a psychology lecture about Rational Emotive Therapy, or R.E.T. You have 45 seconds to read questions 31 to 40.
Good afternoon. Last week, we discussed why people seek therapy. This week, we're going to look at one kind of psychotherapy called rational emotive therapy, or RET. But before we get started, I'd like to quote a first century philosopher called Marcus Aurelius, whose words I think are apposite to this discussion. He wrote something like, The universe is about change. Life is what thinking makes it. R.E.T. is also about accepting the world while changing thought patterns. R.E.T. was created by an American, Albert Ellis, in the 1950s. The main aim of R.E.T. is to develop healthy emotional responses to cope with unfortunate circumstances. Anger, anxiety or depression is replaced with upset, followed by acceptance, then by moving on. Let's take the example of a person who is involved in a car accident. Of course, your physical injuries are your primary concern and satisfactory medical assistance in hospital is critical. But how fast you heal after that assistance is not only determined by the kind of medical care you have received, but also by your attitude. You probably had no control over the accident, but you can control how you feel about it afterwards. Anxiety, guilt and even rage at others involved are all mental states that you can overcome. Here's another scenario. Your sister borrowed some money from you a year or so ago and hasn't made any effort to give it back. A well-balanced person thinks, Oh dear, never mind. But an unbalanced one says, My sister should give me my money back. She mustn't do this to me. Or, she's always been so selfish. She never treats me well. Now, people including your sister are both good and bad, and they do change. Imagining how awful your circumstances are doesn't help. You're far more likely to get your money back if your sister knows you don't judge her and you avoid words like should, must, always and never. One of Albert Ellis's fundamental beliefs was that too many people these days awfulize. Yes, he even coined the term to awfulize. He considered that people make things seem awful that really aren't. They disable themselves through anxiety rather than accepting the challenges there are in modern life. To introduce his ideas to the world, Ellis came up with the ABC scheme. In this, A stands for adversity, something out of the ordinary that causes difficulty. Ellis was convinced that when A struck, it was B, a person's beliefs, that often affected them more than A itself. This leads to C, or consequences. Some of these could be relatively minor, like headaches or skin disorders, but others could be serious and debilitating, like long-term mental illness. Ellis added D to his ABC scheme. This means a person distinguishes between awfulizing and healthy beliefs. During this process of distinguishing, a person's mental worldview undergoes a significant change and as a result, he or she makes a genuine recovery. Albert Ellis set up his practice in the cosseted world of New York City, where the majority of his patients could afford superior medical care and probably hadn't really experienced any great trauma. So what if something really awful does happen? How would RET be effective with those sufferers? Quite a lot of research has been done on refugees from major conflicts. They appear to fall almost equally into two groups. One, the badly affected, and two, the largely unaffected. All the refugees lived through the same war, but they chose to be happy, or they chose to be sad. So, how does RET work? Initially, 
therapists and patients target specific problems and set daily and weekly goals. Exercises are connected to everyday life. There are links on my website to some of these if you're interested. As I mentioned earlier, replacing anger with upset is the first phase of treatment. Anger can be as threatening to the body as the original trauma. Confronting the very thing a patient is afraid of is another approach. If a person has a phobia of cars after an accident, he or she is put right back behind the wheel. Critics of RET say the treatment is too short and too unkind, and its rehabilitation rate of around 40% is not very high. Because it focuses on mental states in the present and it completely ignores a patient's past, detractors believe it fails to address underlying issues. Other more conventional methods of therapy explore the past in some detail. Nevertheless, Ellis and RET have reintroduced rationalist philosophical notions into everyday treatment. I'll leave it up to you to evaluate their success.